Hello and welcome back. Today we're going to be talking about how to brief a case, a legal case, and I hope the speech by Thurgood Marshall was inspiring when he said that it is the law that emancipates us and the rule of law is how we strive for equality in our systems. So we need to know how to brief a case in order to read for ourselves what the Supreme Court talks about when it says this is what our Constitution means. So we're going to jump in the next unit to the Supreme Court, but first before we do that, I'd like to talk to you a little bit today about how to brief a legal case so that when you read these cases, you have an idea of what to look for and you have an idea of what's important for your exam and for your understanding. So we're going to move, be moving to page 360 in your textbook, Marbury versus Madison. Now, I'm using Marbury versus Madison because it's a very famous case, and we're going to be talking about it later on, but I'm also using it to illustrate how to read and brief a legal case. So let's get started. So we start with an acronym, and that acronym is called IRAC. I R A C. IRAC. And IRAC stands for the issue, the rule of law, how do you apply that rule of law, and the conclusion. And we remember that conclusions basically mean, so what? What is a so what question? So law students, if you're interested in going to law school, law students spend about a year learning how to do this. And um, we're going to talk about it in about uh, 15 to 20 minutes. So um, you'll have a leg up on your friends and neighbors who want to go to law school. So IRAC, issue, rule, apply the rule, conclusion. I for issue. R for rule. And that usually means the rule of law that the justices are talking about. A is you apply that rule. And then C, the conclusion. I-R-A-C. So, how do we find the issue of a case? So, every case has a certain pattern to it. That pattern deals with the facts of the case. Okay, before we can deal with any kinds of legal issues, we have to determine what are the facts. Now, again, if you remember, when we talked about the Constitution, we talked about an indictment and due process, and we talked about the role of the jury. The jury is the finder of fact and it is the judge who determines the finder of law. We never can appeal on what the jury has done. So the jury has basically given us what the facts of the case are. So again, we have the facts in an appellate brief. We have what the lower court did, what the jury and the judge did, and then we have, of course, go back to the IRAC, the issue, the rule of law, implying the rule of law, and the conclusion. So, again, on page 360 of your textbook, in Marbury versus Madison, you have a fact situation. And remember, and this is uh, essay number 64, and remember that it's useful to read the italicized um, terms before each essay. It gives you why the authors put this in the book. So we know that establishing judicial review, we know that Chief Justice Marshall in this case basically said that the Supreme Court would be the referee of the system and the Supreme Court would be the interpreters of the Constitution. But the facts are that you had the change of administration. You had the presidency of John Adams and then moving out of the way for Thomas Jefferson. Thomas Jefferson, as we said last time, was a anti-federalist and John Adams was a federalist. And before March 4th, the old inauguration, you had John Adams trying to fill the judiciary up with his uh, supporters, with the federalists. And so again, we start with the facts. The facts are 
as Chief Justice Marshall writes, at the last term on the affidavits then read and filed with the clerk, a rule was granted in this case, requiring the Secretary of State to show cause why a mandamus should not issue, directing him to deliver to William Marbury his commission as a Justice of the Peace for the County of Washington in the District of Columbia. So the facts are that John Adams appointed Mr. Marbury to the Justice of the Peace of Washington, and he gave this appointment to his Secretary of State. Now, why would we have the Secretary of State involved in an appointment of a judge? Because in those days, and it's still true today, the Secretary of State is in charge of the seal of the United States. So what makes something official was the commission had to have that seal. And of course, as Adam is, Adams is winding down his administration, all of these appointments start sort of loading up on, guess who was the Secretary of State at the time? John Marshall, the person who became Chief Justice. And Secretary of State John Marshall leaves office, becomes the Chief Justice, swears in his distant cousin, Thomas Jefferson, and Thomas Jefferson appoints Madison as his Secretary of State. And Madison comes into his office and sees a big stack of commissions and says, what should I do about them? And Jefferson said, hold off, we'll see. And so Mr. Marbury comes and sues the Secretary of State at the time, Madison saying, I fulfilled my obligations for this commission and I should be given that commission. So those are the facts. Now, when you're reading a case, one of the things that you want to look for is this word whether. Whether. Because the judge or the justice or whoever is deciding this case usually says, we are here today to decide whether A is going to get the commission or B is going to get the commission. Whether is a signal word for what the issue is. So there can be several issues in a case, and there can be um, sometimes many issues in a sentence. So you want to read carefully, and if you notice, this is not like reading uh, the newspaper or a novel. So, in, again, in our example, we have this idea of an order from the court to do something. And so even though the Chief Justice doesn't write the word weather, he says uh, in the following terms some of the issues. The first object of inquiry is, on page 361, the first object of inquiry is, first, has the applicant a right of the commission he demands? So that's one, that's one issue, right? Does Marbury, does Marbury have a right to the commission? So that's one issue, right? Does Marbury have a right to the condition, to the commission? So again, IRAC stands for issue, apply the issue, rule of law, and conclusion. I'll write it down later, but I need the space of the board. All right. So that's the first thing, right? This is the first issue. And then he goes on, if he, has a, if he has a right, and that right has been violated, do the laws of his country afford him a remedy? So when you have an issue, you also have to know, okay, what does the court 
what can the court do? What can the court demand? So we have the issue, right? Does Marbury have a right to the commission? And what is his remedy? Right? Can the court deal with the remedy uh, that, Mar that Ma Marsh Marbury demands? It goes on, it appears from the affidavit affidavits that in our in compliance with this law, a commission for William Marbury as Justice of the Peace for the County of Washington was signed by John Adams, then President of the United States, after which the seal of the United States was affixed to it, but the commission has never reached the person for whom it was made out. So the issue, another issue is, do you have the commission if you have not physically received the delivery? Right? Does does the commission, is it valid if it is not delivered? That's another issue. Mr. Marbury then, since his commission was signed by the president and sealed by the Secretary of State, was appointed. And as the law creating the office gave the officer a right to hold for five years, independent of the executive, the appointment was not revocable, but vested in the officer's legal rights, which are protected by the laws of his country. So he is in the right place, right? The first, do we have jurisdiction? And the Chief Justice says, yes, we do. He then goes on to withhold this commission, therefore, is an act deemed by the court not warranted by law, but a volative of the vested legal right. This brings us to the second, on his count, the second issue, which is, if he has a right and that right has been violated, do the laws of this country afford him a remedy? And this is the key, the remedy. He goes on, by the Constitution of the United States, the president is invested with certain important political powers in the exercise of which he is to use his own discretion and is accountable only to his country in his political character. This is a very famous line because this division between political and legal is a very important distinction to his own conscience. To aid him in the performance of these duties, he is authorized to appoint certain officers who act by his authority and in conformity to his orders. In such cases, their acts are his acts, and whatever opinion may be entertained of the manner in which the executive discretion may be used, still there exists and can exist no power to control that discretion. So in the political realm, the president has a monopoly of power. The subjects are political when the subjects are political. They respect the nation, not the individual rights, and being entrusted to the executive, the decision of the executive is to be conclusive. But then he goes on. But when the legislature proceeds to impose on that officer other duties, when he is directed prematurely to perform certain acts, when the right of the individual are dependent on the performance of those acts, he is so far the officer of the law and is amenable to the laws for his conduct and cannot at his discretion sport away the vested rights of others. Even the president cannot and is not above the law. The conclusion from this reasoning is that where he heads of the departments are the political or confidential agents of the executive merely to execute the will of the president, or rather to act in cases in which the executive possesses a constitutional or legal discretion, nothing can be more perfectly clear than that their acts are only politically examinable. Right? The court does not have jurisdiction if we're dealing with the purely political actions of the president. 
but where a specific duty is assigned by law and individual rights depend upon the performance of that duty, it seems equally clear that the individual who considers himself injured has a right to resort to the laws of his country for a, rem a remedy. Okay, so Mr. Marbury says, right, what is your remedy? Do you have a remedy under the law? And so the court basically says yes. Right, so the issue is, does Chief Justice Marshall have a remedy? The rule of law is, is this appointment in the legal sense or the political sense of the duties of the president? And the Chief Justice Marshall, Chief Justice Marshall writes that it is of the legal sense because the rights of Mr. Marbury are affected. and that he has the legal title to the office. Except what? Except the court says, yes, you have a remedy, but you're in the wrong place. He goes on to say, the act to establish the judicial courts of the United States authorizes the Supreme Court to issue writs of mandamus in cases warranted by the principles and the usage of law to any court appointed or persons holding office under the authority of the United States. The Secretary of State, being a person holding an office under the authority of the United States, is precisely within the letter of the description. And if this is, if court is not authorized to issue a writ of mandamus to such an officer, it must be because the law is unconstitutional and therefore absolutely incapable of conferring the authority and assigning the duties which its words purport to confirm and assign. The Constitution vests the whole judicial power of the United States in one Supreme Court, and such inferior courts as Congress shall from time to time ordain and establish. This power is expressly extended to all cases arising under the laws of the United States and consequently in some form may be exercised over the present case because the right claimed is given by a law of the United States. In the distribution of power, it is declared that, quote, the Supreme Court shall have original jurisdiction in all cases affecting ambassadors, other public ministers, and councils, and those in which the state shall be a party. In all other cases, the Supreme Court shall have appellate jurisdiction. Now remember, we talked a little bit about that distinction between original jurisdiction and appellate jurisdiction. Original jurisdiction is what you see on television. When they have the jury, they have testimony, and they have, again, the drama of the courtroom. The appellate jurisdiction only talks about the record of the case. There's no new testimony. There's no facts that are trying to be found. We're only dealing with the errors in the law, what the judge did. And so, again, when we're reading appellate jurisdictional cases, when we put IRAC into action, we have to remember that we are, the facts are already given to us, and that we are dealing with what is the Supreme Court, or what is the appellate court, saying about these errors in the law, or what are they interpreting the Constitution as doing. And so, again, Marbury thinks he wins, but he knows probably not. Same with the people who supported Jefferson. Thomas Jefferson knew right away this was not going to be a, this is not a victory, but it was an incredible power grab by the Supreme Court. But his supporters at first blush thought it was, the way this is written. So again, what are we talking about? We're talking about does the remedy exist for a private person under the laws in a generic sense of an appointment? Were the procedures followed through? And the answer is yes. But Chief Justice Marshall also talks about so the issue is the remedy. Marshall applies he applies the issue by saying in a normal sense, yes, you would have 
your appointment. You would have a remedy. But the president, acting with Congress in a legal sense, in a legal sense, who tells the president and Congress what is the meaning of the Constitution? Who interprets the Constitution? And Marshall says, it is the Supreme Court. And then he goes on to tell Marbury, basically, you're in the wrong place because the Supreme Court is a appellate court and you haven't gone to a court yet with original jurisdiction. You think you might have a good case, but you're in the wrong place. So we apply the question of being a legal case. The Supreme Court interprets the Constitution, right? Judicial, we call this judicial review. And so we would conclude our briefing of the case is that Marbury versus Madison is very important because it gives the Supreme Court the power, because it's not in the Constitution, it gives the Supreme Court the power to interpret the Constitution as a legal document. Remember I talked, when we talked about the Constitution, that it's one of those rare constitutions that is legal as well as being political. And so, again, that's why this case is important. So take some time, review, again, some of the cases that are in your book early on, and then practice reading a case and determining and using IRAP. What is the issue? Ask yourself. What is the rule of law? Ask yourself. How do I apply this rule of law? And what is the conclusion? IRAP. Issue, rule, apply, conclude. That's the objective for this little introduction to how to read a legal case. Because again, you shouldn't be taking my word for what it is or someone else you know tells you what is constitutional and what's not constitutional. My opinions do not matter. Your opinions do not matter in interpreting the Constitution. What matters? The people on the Supreme Court. Those people on the Supreme Court tell us how to interpret these cases. And for a generation or two, right, whenever the, the length of these people who are given lifetime appointments, whenever they pass away, then the courts also just can't make things up. They have to deal with precedent. What did the previous courts say? And so, again, when you're looking at and reading a, a case, do not be intimidated by it. You can do this, right? First, ask yourself, read it once, and ask yourself, what are the facts? And take notes and list it down. What are the facts of the case? And sometimes, if you don't want to deal with names, you can use Greek alphabet. You can use defendant, right? Delta or plaintiff, right? You can use any code that you want. But the way to decipher cases and the way to really understand a case is by using IRAC and also by putting it in your own words. Don't spend a lot of time copying the cases. Even maybe it might be a famous line from a case written eloquently by a justice. Some are very eloquent, others are not, right? But what you wanna do is you wanna make sure that you can articulate it in your own words. Again, this brief little tutorial on how to read a how to read a legal case is important because we are going to be reading legal cases now until the end of the class. So again, thank you for coming by and make sure that you look at the video of the Supreme Court that I'm going to have also inside the class. It's an excellent introduction to Marbury versus Madison. And then give it give it a try. Try to read it yourself. Have a good day.